we're live, we're live, we're live. Welcome to everybody, everybody who may have uh, tuned in to see a Revelation tonight, and uh, we're ready to get started and ready to get going. Uh, yeah, some more Revelation, I'm telling you. Um, this tonight, just to give you an idea, I'm going to try to be a little bit ambitious with how much we cover, because uh, this that we begin in tonight is really pretty straightforward. I mean, it's it, there are a lot of symbols and there are a lot of things that'll be interesting that, you know, you'll hear why certain things are called certain things and what it is and all that. But it's pretty straightforward about what is actually happening. It's not really going to be confusing about what's going on because we're now at the point where the rubber meets the road. And uh, the rubber meets the road. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's coming down to the end now. And... Um, We've been in, you know, we've been in this big intermission, and by intermission, that, that means basically, all right, the story has gone to a certain point, and then the Spirit comes back and says, all right, now let me tell you what's going on in heaven and spiritually while this stuff is happening on earth, because it just kind of takes you through the, the seals and the trumpets, and then you get to the sixth trumpet, and the Spirit kind of takes you back and says, all right, in chapter 10, remember, John had become a little discouraged, and um, the Lord brings him up, up into heaven, and the angel talks to him, and, and, he, and the angel has this little mini scroll, and the angel uh, and the spirit says All right, to John, go, go get that scroll out of his hand, and he went and asked him for the scroll, and he said, all right, now you got to eat it, and you remember when he said, when you eat it, it's going to be sweet in your mouth, it's going to be bitter in your stomach. And then the last verse says, all right, now just know that you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to prophesy some more and do what you're supposed to and so forth. So basically chapter 10 just tells us that God took a moment to encourage John because John evidently was getting worn out or overwhelmed or everything that he was seeing was just, you know, messing him up, messing him up. And so God takes a little time and, and, and ministers to John a little bit in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, um, the Antichrist kills the two witnesses on the streets of Jerusalem and lets their bodies lay there for three days and all the people come by and spit on them and stomp on them and do whatever else they want to do to them. And they have parties and they give Christmas, pre well, not Christmas, but they give presents like it's Christmas because these two people that have been tormenting them and torturing them, the, the, the messengers of God, crashing every party, pooping every joyful occasion, doing whatever they wanted to do because the Antichrist couldn't hurt them, couldn't harm them, couldn't do anything to stop them. They could shoot fire out of their mouth. They could call plagues down on the earth. Well, God takes his anointing off or allows the Antichrist to be able to kill them he kills them. They lay on the streets of Jerusalem. After three days, God raises them up, and they go up to heaven in the presence of everybody. And then in chapter 12, you have the picture of the big red dragon flying around in heaven and the woman who's birthing the child and the dragon's waiting to eat the child as soon as the child comes out. And, um, and, and then the scene of uh, Satan fighting against Michael and all the angels in heaven and Satan is cast down to the earth and he's all mad about the fact that, you know, he's been cast down to earth and he knows he has but a little season and he begins to persecute Israel and try to kill everybody that has anything to do with God. And then in chapter 13, um, the Antichrist is introduced to us as the beast that comes up out of the sea and this is the sea of humanity, so we're, he's the Antichrist, he's the political leader on the earth, and then there's another beast that comes up out of the land, which I said most likely was the land of Israel, and he is the religious person, he is the false prophet, he's like the spirit of deception, he, he's like the anti-Holy Spirit. You know, you have the Father, Jesus, of the Father, God, the Son, Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. Well, the unholy trinity is the Antichrist, the dragon, which is the anti-God, and the false prophet, which is the anti-Holy Spirit. So the, holy, the, 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 the false prophet gives power to the Antichrist, just like the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus. And they're all led by the dragon, which is Satan, just like 
Jesus and the Holy Spirit are led by the Father God. It, it, it's the same type of arrangement, except it's the unholy trinity. Well, that's introduced in chapter 13. Then in chapter 14, you get a picture of the end of, uh, of everything right, right before the Battle of Armageddon and the 144,000 Jews that have been sealed to preach the gospel during the tribulation period. They're standing with Jesus and Jesus, and you get a picture of them and, and, uh, and they're with Christ and he's uh, congratulating them and they're, you know, some pomp and circumstance about that. And then the battle of Armageddon is described. It's not called the battle of Armageddon in chapter, in chapter uh, 14, but it is a description of the battle of Armageddon. Then in chapter 15 that we looked at last week, you remember you have that heavenly worship service where they sing the song of Moses and they sing the song of the Lamb and everybody is just celebrating and, and worship goes up. And, and, and now we come to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, the bowls are finally poured out on the earth. So let's look at uh, rapid fire judgment. All right, let me see. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can read that. Yeah, okay, good. All right. Here, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels. Now, these seven angels are the, are the seven angels with the seven bowls of wrath. Remember, we have seven seals. Then we have seven trumpets. Now we have seven bowls of wrath. And these are the last seven things, the last seven judgments that are going to come on the earth. There, there are three waves of judgment that come on the earth. The seven seals that are broken, which basically begin the tribulation period. Um, they happen during the first three and a half years of tribulation for the most part. The seven trumpets start trumping. They're the first, uh, first two, three, four are in the first three and a half years of tribulation. You know, that's stuff like a third of the sun and the moon and the stars going dark, uh, a third of the ships being destroyed, a third of the sea becomes blood, uh, the meteor falls out of the sky, wormwood makes all the water bitter. And, I mean, those all happen during the first three and a half years of tribulation. And then starting with the fifth trumpet, the fifth trumpet introduces the Antichrist, and, and, it, and it's called the first woe trumpet. You remember the angel flew through the sky and said, whoa, 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 three woes. said, four trumpets have sounded, three are yet to sound, and these last three are going to bring so much horror to the earth, it's unbelievable, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And the woe trumpets most likely start the last half of the tribulation period, which is that period of time where the Antichrist tries to kill all the Jews turns against them, uh, hunts them down. Uh, of course, all through the tribulation period, every Christian is being hunted and, and martyred and head cut off and whatever else they want to do to any Christian. But the, it, but, but the first three and a half years, the Antichrist is trying to convince Israel that he's their friend and he's going to take care of them and he's the, got their back and he's their buddy and all that. And halfway through, he betrays them by bringing a pig down to put on the altar at Solomon's temple that's been rebuilt where the mosque of Omar is right now and defiles the temple. He's called the abomination of desolation. Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25 said to the Jews, when you see the abomination of desolation set up in the temple, run for your lives because you, that's it. He's after you. You know, it's going to be a thousand times worse than Hitler ever even thought about being or anybody else thought about being, and you're going to be hunted on the Judean hills. And if I didn't have a place prepared for you and people prepared to take care of you, you would be wiped off the face of the earth. Because, see, here's the, here's the whole impetus of the thing. What, what Satan wants to do is to stop God's plan from happening. No matter, no matter what it takes. Well, he knows that he's not going to be able to defeat God. I mean, he, he, he got his behind kicked by Michael. I mean, and, and Michael's just an angel and threw him out of, down to the earth and, and cast all, a third of the angels out with him. So, I mean, what chance does he have against God? He has no chance against God. So what can he do? Well, if he can kill all the Jews, then God's plan of 
uh, rescuing the Jews in the end and, 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 and giving them a place to rule during the thousand-year millennial reign will be thwarted because there won't be any Jews to, to inhabit any thrones or be in the, in the city of Jerusalem during the millennium because all the Jews will be dead. So God's plan is thwarted. Okay, so I can't kill God. Let me kill it. Let me try the other end of the, of the scale. So he tries to kill Jesus. He tries to stop Jesus from being born. He tries to wipe out all the Jews. All the way from the Old Testament, ever since God made a covenant with Abraham, Satan tried to stop that covenant from being successful. You know, he, I mean, here comes Ishmael instead of Isaac. Uh, every time you turn around, every world leader is trying to kill all the Jews. Uh, they tried to kill all the, the, the Hebrew baby boys from two years old under when Jesus was born, trying to kill Jesus. They tried to stop Jesus. They crucified Jesus. They tried to stop. And, and, and in every way, the world, led by an enemy of God, has tried to thwart God's plan by annihilating God's covenant people off the earth. So here it is. Here's, here's this last dish effort now. During the last three and a half years of tribulation, I'll get God. I'll stop his plan. I'll kill all the people. Won't, he won't have, there won't be any covenant people left for him to keep his covenant with because I'm going to kill all of them. So here we are now at the, at the last three and a half years of tribulation, and here's what happens. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, that's got to be God's voice, by the way, saying, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. First bowl gets poured out. So uh, the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and on those who worshipped his image. So the first bowl, angels, I mean, picture them lined up. They got the bowls in the hand. God says, all right, go pour the bowls. First angel walks over there, pours that bowl out, and uh, cancerous sores. Loathsome means cancerous. It means you, you can't heal. They, get, they, won't, they ooze, and, they, and you can't get them to heal. Fester. They fester. And, they, and, and I, I'm just thinking now, uh, this is just a thought of mine, so don't go to heaven and tell God this is fact. But because it mentions in this verse, upon those who have the mark of the beast and who have the image of his name, that, that the loathsome sores appear on their bodies where the marks are. It's just my thought about it. In other words, all of a sudden, in the middle of the forehead, if you got the mark of the beast, that mark, it just pops out into a big skin cancer, and it just starts oozing stuff, right? And then on your on your hand, it, where where that mark is, boom! There's a big cancer there, and it and it's painful, and it's and it's oozing, and it can't be healed. In other words, it's disfiguring. It it it, it, it it's a it's a it's a horrible thing. So the first. Like leprosy, yeah, like a leprosy kind of a deal. And, it, you know, you remember all the warnings that God tried to give them about don't take this mark and don't get the number on you because you're going to be sorry if you do and all that. And they said, well, we got to have it to buy, sell, and do anything or live, so we're going to get it. And he said, you're going to be sorry you ever got it. And boom, here comes the first bowl, and now loathsome sores appear. Then the second angel poured out his bowl and on the sea. And it became blood, and, and, and notice the description, as if it were, as if a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. In other words, it's, it's a, uh, not only does the sea turn to blood, now remember back when the second trumpet sounded. The second trumpet sounded, and a, uh, y'all, wait, hold on. <laughs> Lord, trying to put, put his foot on something. Yeah, right, that's right, trying to get you some comfort. But anyway, you remember when the second trumpet sounded, a third of the sea turned to blood, and a third of the living creatures died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now you got the sea, when the bowl, second bowl's poured out, the sea's involved with it again, but it's not a third of the sea, it's all of the sea. And it turns to blood, and notice what it says, like, like a dead man, like a dead man's blood. Oh, thick uh, non-oxygenated, deep red, crimson, stinking, foul, uh, nasty blood. Yeah, <laughs> blood. And the whole sea and everything in the sea and every living creature in the sea dies. 
All right, I'll go on because Pat can't stand any more description of that. And the fourth bowl. Then, then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. So now the fresh water becomes blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, now this is something new. You know, this is the first time an angel has said anything about any of these judgments. But notice the angel is basically saying, hey, God, you had a right to do this because you're righteous and they're terrible. And notice what he says about them. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, you are righteous, O oh God. You, you did good. You, you have the right to do this. The one who is and who was and who is to be. By the way, uh, that's a description of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who is, who was, and who is to be. In a minute, you're gonna, we're going to see a description of Satan in chapter 17. And he's described, or the Antichrist, he's described as the one who was and the one who was not and yet is. That's going to be his little line. God is the one who is, who was, and who will be. And Antichrist is the one who is and uh, who was and who is yet to be, uh, who yet is, no, who is, who was and is not and is yet to be. Just a little bit of description there. Because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The one from the altar, now let me just mention this, that that in some manuscripts of the of the scripture, the word uh, the word from the altar, or yeah, and I heard another from the altar saying, "From thee is left out," and it just says, "And I heard the altar say," and it does. I mean, it is a difference in 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 what concept you have there, but it doesn't make any difference about what actually happens, whether the altar talks or somebody. You remember the souls that were under the altar. You remember you saw them, and it was the martyrs, and they were under the altar, and they were saying to God, how long are you going to let this go on and not avenge our blood? Well, here's some souls under the altar. Not only is the angel in charge of the waters saying, God, you had the right to do this. These people shed the people innocent blood, and it's right that you shed their blood, and so you, your judgment is righteous, and you did what was right. And then the souls from under the altar say, yeah, God, Lord Almighty, finally just reward. You remember the Bible started with a martyr's blood crying out, right? Cain killed Abel, and what did God say? Uh, to Cain, uh, hey Cain, where are your brother Abel? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, well, innocent blood is crying out to me. So this is not the first time innocent blood has cried out to God for justice, the blood of a martyr. And now, but this will be the last time, by the way, and he says, all right, God, you did it. You're righteous. Your judgments are true and righteous. You had, the right, you had the ability to do that. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and, the, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, that's one of the most amazing things to me is how in the world can these jokers be, I mean, this is the third round of plagues and, and disaster and everything, and they still won't repent. As a matter of fact, they get harder. They get harder than ever. The, just, the judgment of God just makes them harder, kind of like Pharaoh. You remember it did the same thing to Pharaoh. Moses, when he said, let my people go, and he said, I'm not letting them go. And Moses started turning the, the Nile River to blood and frogs and lice and, uh, and then uh, darkness over the earth and all that. And, and every, every one of them, Pharaoh, heart, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And Pharaoh got more resistant. It was only on the very last one where the firstborn died and Israel put the blood on the doorpost and their firstborn didn't die which is called the Passover, by the way. That's where the Passover, that's what it means. That's where it started, that the spirit of the death angel of God passed over that house because it had the blood on the doorpost. But Pharaoh obviously didn't have any blood on his doorpost, and his firstborn child died, and it, that, that broke him down, and he said, get out of here with those people. And then it, they left, and by the time they got 
out to the city limits, he decided he, he didn't want them to leave, and he started chasing them and went to the Red Sea, and God parts it, and they cross, and he gets in there, and God caught, folds the sea back in, and boom, they're all dead, Pharaoh and his army and so forth. So anyway, my point is that here we are again with, uh, with people hardening their hearts. But notice what it says. It said that the sun got hotter than ever, and it scorched the people. Now remember, on the uh, with the with the trumpets uh, when the when the uh, what was it the third one when the fourth trumpet that's it when the fourth trumpet sounded one third of the sun was darkened one third of the moon was darkened one third of the stars were darkened now God touches the sun and it gets scorching hot fiery hot hot um, I mean there are a lot of scientific explanations as to what could happen here with uh, with the sun and, and, and it being a star and it having sun flares. And I mean, there are all kinds of scientific explanations about that, but it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the result is that men get burnt up and scorched by the sun. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now that most likely means the city where the throne was. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what, which city, what city it might be talking about, there are two possibilities, I believe. In, in, the, in the kingdom of the beast, the Antichrist, it's going to be a kingdom, and it's going to involve countries. You know, you've seen descriptions, the, ten head, the seven heads and the ten horns and so forth, and the, and the kings. And so the, the empire of the Antichrist is going to be a kingdom, a, a, a revived Roman empire. Uh, the lands that made up the initial Roman Empire revived and, and brought back into prominence. And, that's, and he's going to rule over that. Uh, the, we know that the religious capital, the religious capital of the Antichrist kingdom is going to be Jerusalem because he's going to go into the temple and he's going to set his throne up in the temple and he's going to sit on the throne according what the, to what, what, the, what the Apostle Paul says, that he's going to sit down on that, row, that throne calling himself God to prove that he is God. So the religious capital of the Antichrist kingdom is going to be the city of Jerusalem. So I don't know, this might be the city of Jerusalem is going to be hit with this next bowl or the political capital now, the political capital is going to be a place where the economies of the world and the, and the, uh, the, the economic and political leadership happens, and it's going to be a, a city that is described as Babylon. But Babylon, the city, no longer exists. Right. It could be New York. Right. It could be New York. It could be Rome. It could be, it, it could be any major gigantic city where economies, where it could be the hub of the economy of the world. Stock markets, business, politics. Uh, I mean, N New York City would be a great example because the UN and all the economies of the world and the stock market and all that kind of stuff there. So the point, the, the, but the point is that this is an attack against the very heart of the Antichrist world. All this other stuff has been poured out just on the world in general, and now God zooms in and, and, and starts attacking his hometown and attacking him personally. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed on their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds." So God attacks. Now, the one thing I want you to notice here, we're now to the fifth angel. The first angel, remember, the first angel poured out and loathsome sores popped out on all these people. I just want you to know that we're on the fifth angel and they still got their sores. Mm -hmm. Because now, I mean, they're, and the pains and their sores. It, in other words, the sores that were there with the first bowl are still on them by the fifth bowl. And they're gnawing their tongues. They're, they, they can't get relief. They're pain beyond. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had supernatural kind of terrible pain. 
But if you've ever had it and you can't get any relief and it's just, it, it's just a torment and a torture to you and, it's, and you, you, you just, you know, you're beside yourself. This is, this is the description of what's going on in the fifth seal. And, they, and it's been going on ever since the first seal. And the sixth angel, notice how quickly, man, these things just pow, pow, just one right after another. Just, they don't even have time to recover at all from any, anything until the next one hits them. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. By the way, the Euphrates is mentioned, I believe, 25 times in the Bible. That river, the Euphrates River. The Euphrates, Euphrates River is a, is a river, obviously, that, that exists now. It starts in uh, Turkey. And it goes down through Syria, and it goes down through Iraq, and it goes down into the Persian Gulf. It's 1,700 miles long, gigantic, big river. So the Euphrates River is not only uh, a physical obstacle, but now, I mean, let's be real about it. The, uh, to a modern army, to a modern army that has the weaponry that modern armies have, a river would not really be a big problem to cross. But it's, it represents, uh, the Euphrates is, has always been viewed as a dividing line between the West and the, and the East, the Far East. Um, it was the edge of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire went to the Euphrates River. It, it's going to be the edge of the Antichrist Empire because remember the Antichrist is going, his kingdom is going to be the revived Roman Empire. The, the same... Uh, uh, area that covered the old Roman Empire is going to be his kingdom. The revi it's, it's called the revived Roman Empire. And so the Euphrates River is going to be the borderline of his kingdom. It's the borderline between east and west. And so now God pours out a bowl and the Euphrates River dries up. So it's like an opening from, from the west to say to the east, all right, come on, it's time now to attack. Because here's what's been going on. What has been going on in the East, the Far East? Now, when we're talking about the Far East, we're talking about the Orient. We're talking about China. You remember back, uh, what was it? The, um, gosh, the eighth, the, the, in chapter eight, we were introduced to a two million man army that came from the East. Does that sound familiar to anybody? All right, this two million man army that comes from the East is going to come to fight a war. Well, I think, and it's just my thinking, I'm thinking, here, here they come. This, this is them. Um, and here's what is happening. All right, the Antichrist kingdom is the Western world. The Eastern world is, is not involved in the Antichrist kingdom. In other words, China's not involved. The Antichrist has no control over China, has no control over Japan, has no control over the Korean, has no control over India. Those are the Far East. Well, they have control over the revived Roman Empire, which is the Western world, not only, not only Europe and Turkey and, uh, and Germany and France and England and the, the Ro old Roman Empire, but all those nations that are spawned out of the old Roman Empire, like the United States, Canada, uh, the Western world. So, all right, here we have the Western world dominating the globe, the, the economy of the Antichrist, the religion of the Antichrist, the, the Antichrist this, the Antichrist that. The, and the East is just sitting over there seething. They're sitting over there going, who does he think he is? He's beginning to interfere with our business. He's getting into our life. We, oh, we're going to get him. We're going to... And so... All of the time of tribulation, the East, the kings of the East are being, are, are, are growing more and more angry and hostile toward the Antichrist. And they devise a plan to, of course, this is Satan's inspiration inside them. And you'll see it in, in a few minutes. You'll see what I'm talking about. Satan Satan is, is, is creating a hatred in them so that they will come west to fight against the Antichrist. So they, they're coming across thinking, we're going to kill the Antichrist. We're going to take his city. We're gonna, they're marching to Jerusalem 
so they can conquer the Antichrist. That's what they think. But what they're really going to be drawn to is the Battle of Armageddon. Which, that's right. Which they think they're coming to fight the Antichrist, but as they get there, they're going to, their, their, their anger is going to be turned by the Antichrist against God and God's people, and they're going to become a part of the whole world that attacks Jerusalem. You, uh, you'll, see, you'll see in just a minute, but, but I just want you to see that this is when it starts. When this sixth bowl is poured out, the Euphrates River dries up, and the kings of the east go, uh-oh, let's get them. And because now, look at, look at how they've been inspired. Uh, and its water dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this or you've seen this, but frogs, people, spiritual people have always looked at frogs as being not something that you want to hang in your house or because they're symbols of demons. Now, if you wonder why people thought that, here it is. Because these, these unclean spirits, that there, there, are, there are nine of them. Three come out of the dragon's mouth, three comes out of the antichrist's mouth, and three come out of the false prophet's mouth. Uh, and, they're, and they're described as frogs. And I thought, why in the world would, would they, I mean, frogs, why would these demons be described as frogs? And then I got thinking, okay, well, frogs are creatures of two worlds, Right? I mean, they're amphibians, and they're, they're water, and they're earth, and they, they, they swim, and they're comfortable, blah, blah. They're also chameleon-like. They can change colors. They have the ability to, to blend in and, and, and look, and, and you won't see them, and you won't notice them, and many of them are poisonous. So frogs have characteristics like demons, you know, that they're, they're, they're cunning, they change their shape, they change their form, they're creatures of two worlds, uh, they run with the rabbits and hunt with the hounds, uh, you know, so, but, but, but these demons come out of the, the mouth of the Antichrist, the dragon, and the false prophet, and they influence the kings of the east. In other words, whatever's coming out of their mouth is influencing these kings to, to come west, to come on and fight. Come on and, 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 and you think you can take us. Come on. Yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever these frogs are saying, it's causing the kings of the east to get fired up to come west. And, it's, and see, this is a God thing. See, the Antichrist is thinking, I, I'm going I'm to get them right where I want them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to influence them come. But here's God. This is God's plan all along. And God is just allowing the Antichrist and the false prophet and the dragon to work his will. It's amazing. For they are, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And uh, See, the, the Antichrist... Is, is drawing them to the, the great battle at the end of the age, which is Armageddon. And these spirits are helping seduce them and influence them and, and encourage them and convince them. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. All right, chapter 16. Bowls are poured out. We're down to bowl number six. And bowl number six dries up the Euphrates, calls them to the east, calls the kings of the east to come, and they're all gathered to a place that is called Armageddon. Now, step back in chapter 17, and we're going to see, um, in chapter 17, you're going to see that, uh, that, that God uh, describes the destruction of the Antichrist and his kingdom. But let's get verse 17. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of, of heaven, which you gotta, you got to assume is God's voice saying it is done. So that's, God said, all right, that's it. It's done. Everything is done and ready, ready to be taken care of, and ready to be finished. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now, you remember at the seventh, at the seventh seal, there were lightning and thunderings and earthquake. 
at the seventh trumpet, there were lightnings and thunderings and earthquakes. Now at the seventh bowl, there are lightnings and thunderings and earthquakes. But this earthquake is so gigantic, there's never been one. And now, verse 19, now the great city, which is most likely Jerusalem or Rome or is the capital city of the, of the beast, and, and I'm not positive what, which city that be, but the great city was divided into three parts. In other words, this thing was so gigantic, this earthquake was so gigantic, it split, and the city was broken up into three parts. It had like giant uh, 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 breaks th down the streets and through, through the streets, and, it was, and, it, and notice it not only changed the city, uh, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. When this earthquake hits, the whole geography of the earth changes. Plate things move out of their place. And great hail, look at this, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent was the largest weight in the Hebrew scale, and it represented the weight that a normal man could carry. And it was a hundred. It was a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds. So you got hailstones that are a hundred pounds falling, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So these guys are just hardening themselves harder against God, and God says it is done, and. And let me just say this. We're going to go into two chapters now that show us the destruction of the harlot on the throne, which is the religious system of Babylon, and then the city of Babylon. Chapter 17 is about, about the religious Babylon. Chapter 18 is about the city of Babylon, the political capital of Babylon. But I want you to know that when the seven bowls are poured out, the next thing that happens is Jesus comes back and the battle of Armageddon is fought, and he sets up his kingdom. So the two chapters that we're about to look at are basically like a parenthesis, okay, here's what it was like when, the, when, this, when this religious harlot was destroyed, and here's what it was like when this political city was destroyed. But when the, seven, when the seventh bowl is poured out, Jesus comes. So just, I mean, even though the next, we have two chapters in between, he's coming in chapter 19. So chapter 17 is just kind of like, a, okay, let me tell you what happens to this religious city and then what happens to this political city. But, but when he said it is done, that means Jesus is coming. He's on his way. He's coming back on the white horse and he's going to fight the battle of Armageddon. He's going to throw Satan out and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see chapter 17 now. Mother Babylon has fallen. When we start reading this, this is a scarlet the scarlet woman and the scarlet beast. Uh, then one of the, are, is, are y'all following this so far? Am I just kind of jumping around and y'all aren't, I mean, do you know what's going on? Okay, we're good. All right. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The great harlot is the, is the, um, the church of the Antichrist. It's the church that functions during the tribulation period. It's the, it's the worldwide church. It's the, it's the church that uh, is the false church of the Antichrist that controls the religious activities of the world. And God calls it a great harlot that sits on the throne, and she sits on many waters. Now, you're going to find out in verse 15 that many waters means nations, peoples, and languages. So she occupies the, the world. She occupies the water. She sits on many waters means that she rules over many nations, many peoples, many tongues, many languages. So here she is. Uh, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, she deceived people. She deceived the kings. They, they I mean, th this, is, this is a church that is totally occupied in the ministry of the Antichrist. And if, if you wanted to try to just see it like it would be now, it would be if our political world right now had a church 
that pretended to be a spiritual church and pretended to represent the kingdom of God, but really was there to basically represent the political system the, and do the bidding of the political system and keep the people under control by convincing them of spiritual things, but really they were just a pawn of the political system. And the political system gives them their power, and they're able to do things because the political system enables them to do it. They can arrest people. They can have people arrested. They can have people uh, punished. Uh, they can uh, take people's possessions, houses. I mean, this, this, is, this is a big religious system that has power because the beast empowers them to do whatever they want to do because... They think they're controlling the beast, but the beast is really controlling them. Now, if you can think of, a, of it, even in our day, if you could, could see that happening with some big church and so forth, you could be seeing exactly what's happening here. And this, right, this chapter is the judgment of that great whore, is what the old King James calls her, harlot, prostitute, that sits on the throne pretending to be a church of God. And notice, and the kings, the kings commit fornication. That just means spiritual wickedness and so forth. And, and the people are so blinded by this, they don't know right from wrong. They don't know whether it's God or whether it's evil. They just, they're deceived by it. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So she's sitting on the beast, which says she thinks she's in control. You know, kind of like riding. She's the rider. Well, so she, she thinks... She's in control, but, and, and notice it's the beast that gives her her power. And I saw her sitting on the scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this is obviously that same beast that was trying to eat the child that the woman was going to have back in chapter 15. Uh, this is that same beast. This is that old dragon. And she's sitting on top of him, and he has all kinds of blasphemous God insult and names written on him which shows his real character. That's who he really is. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. That's kind of, those are rich colors, you know, very difficult colors. Uh, purple robes, scarlet sashes, you know, and adorned with a gold, and adorned with gold. Look, it, she's completely, fabulously wealthy and loves to show off her wealth. Uh, Thomas Aquinas one of the uh, Catholic theologians back way years ago uh, was being the, the was taking the, the the Pope through Saint Peter's Basilica in Rome, and the Pope was looking around at all the gold statues and the silver vessels and all that, and said to Thomas Aquinas, uh, "Well, Thomas, no longer can we say." Uh, we have no gold, silver, or precious stones. And Aquinas said, yeah, and neither can we say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Just think about that. Here we are. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And on her head, forehead, a name was written. Her name is Mystery which just means that we don't know what her name is. I mean, we don't know who he's talking about. Her name right now is a mystery. Now, don't think of spooky. Think of not yet revealed by God. Uh, her name is mystery because God doesn't want us to know her name. She's probably alive right now. She's probably functioning right now. But we don't know that because we don't know her name. Her name is just mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. In other words, John says, uh, when I saw her, I was, I was, you know, I was puzzled by this. Uh, it's not like he has any respect. Like, he's amazed and it's like, oh, I wonder. No, it's like, who is this? What is this? And he was thinking, what could this be? And so the next verse 7, here comes the meaning. God tells him what, what this is. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? Why are you confused? I, let, 
I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns, which I say thank you because I want to know for sure about that. The beast that you saw, look at here, was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. All right, John says, all right, here's the beast. The beast that you saw is someone who was, in other words, he once was, and is not, and yet is. So here he is. He's, the beast is somebody that was at one time, and then he went away. He was not, and then he came back. So he's, talk, he's talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist was, and then he got killed. You remember this? He got a wound, a fatal head wound. And then he came back. And when he came back, notice what it said, it caused the people whose names are not written in the book of life to marvel at him and say, who is like the beast? And who is... So he's talking about the dragon is the Antichrist, which I, I told you back in chapter 13, that's the, the dragon was the Antichrist, and there he is. But this is just confirmation of that. And, uh, and, and so there he is, and he calls the people to marvel. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Rome is called the city on seven hills. It's the only city in the world that sits on seven hills. So we're going to have to assume that this is talking about Rome. So the seven heads, which, by the way, there is a gigantic religious function in Rome, in case you don't know, gigantic uh, religious system of the world. Don't, I'm not saying that that's the Antichrist or that's the mother of harlots. I'm just saying that that is an example is what I'm saying to you. The seven heads are seven mountains which on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So here he's describing some kings, and he says, all right, the kings, there are five that were, so there were five kings that came before the current one. The current one is, which is most likely Domitian. He's talking about the kings of the Roman Empire. The five that were, were the five former kings of the Roman Empire. The one that is, is the one that's alive when John is banished to the Isle of Patmos, which is Domitian. And the one that is yet to come is one that'll come after. And then the Antichrist is the last Gentile world leader. So he's just describing for us to let us know that he's talking about this is the Antichrist, this is the revived empire. Um, he, he's going to rule it just like all the kings that have come before, but he's going to be the very last Gentile world leader. World leader. Uh, I mean, remember now, we are in what is called the times of the Gentiles. And that just simply means that the Gentiles have control over the Holy Land and over Jerusalem. I mean, even though the Jews have it, I mean, we still have control over it. I mean, we just decided to put our embassy in Jerusalem. I mean, it's almost like, well, what right do we have to tell Jerusalem where their, where their embassies are, what their capital city? But see, we, the, the Lord has given the Gentiles the ability to control that area until he is finished with the Gentiles controlling that. And, it, and it's called, we're living in the times of the Gentiles. One of these days, the scripture says that the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Well, when will that be? It will be when the last Gentile world leader finally loses control and the last Gentile world leader is going to be the Antichrist. Now, remember I told you the Antichrist is coming out of the sea. He was the beast out of the sea. The sea represents the nations of the, the, the sea of humanity, the sea of the world, the sea of nations. Daniel tells us this, by the way. That's not just I, I'm, I'm thinking. 
Dan the book of Daniel tells us that, that the sea is the, is the sea of humanity and the sea of the Gentile nations. So the Antichrist comes out of the sea of Gentile nations, which means he's going to be a Gentile. The religious leader, which is the false prophet, comes out of the land, which is most likely the land of Israel. So he's going to most likely be a Jewish person. He's going to, he knows the customs. He operates in the temple. He's very religious in the Jewish ways, rites, customs, and so forth. So what we have, the last Gentile world leader will be the eighth king. Notice it says there are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. At, the, at that time, there will be another leader. He is, he's not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So there's the first little time of the Antichrist. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So the Antichrist, and I don't want this to sound confusing, but the, the Antichrist is both the seventh and the eighth king. Uh, remember the Antichrist, the first time he comes to rule, the first three and a half years, he's Israel's friend, he's a man of peace, he takes over the world without a shot being fired, he has a bow but no arrows, he's riding on a white horse, he pretends to be a champion and a conqueror, and then he gets that fatal head wound, and when he gets that fatal head wound, he goes into the abyss and when he comes out of the abyss, he's now basically the reincarnation of Satan himself. He begins to kill the Jews. He sets his throne up in the kingdom. He becomes this fire-breathing dragon that's trying to eat up the people of God and the nation of Israel. So in other words, I, I, I think what this is saying is that the Antichrist is both the seventh and the eighth king, Gentile king. But anyway, regardless of that, that's not going to keep you out of heaven one way or another. The ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. So there will be ten kings in the days of the Antichrist. We, they haven't come into their kingdom yet. They're not ruling anywhere yet. But they will when the Antichrist comes into control. But they receive authority for one hour, which just simply means for a very short time in comparison to time, that one hour. It doesn't mean literally they're going to have it for one hour. It means that their time of power is going to be very short. They have received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and their authority to the beast. So they're going to work for him. They're going to allow him to control. They're, they're his boys. They're his, you know, his lackeys. These will make war with the lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So what he's saying here is that these kings and these world leaders are going to give their support to the beast, and, and he's going to give them authority. He's going to, they're going to be able to be big shots because he gives them the authority to do that. And he's going to give them power, and they're going to have some control, and they're going to have some limelight and some publicity and all of that kind of stuff. And they are going to be the ones who come to the Battle of Armageddon along with the kings of the east, along with everybody on earth, everybody. In, in that battle in Ezekiel 38 that happens during the tribulation period that's not Armageddon, you remember we talked about that? That battle happens, and... And it's, and it's Russia, it's Gog and Magog and, and, and uh, Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya and Ethiopia. And it, it's that group coming against Jerusalem. At the end, it's everybody in the whole world coming against them. It's all the armies of the earth coming against them. And so these kings are going to be those, some of those that come against the lamb and the lamb's going to tear them up. They're not going to win. And uh, we're going to be with him. Notice it says, uh, and those who are with him, who are with the Lamb, are called chosen and faithful, which is all of those that are in heaven at the time that Jesus comes. We're going to come back with him. We're not going to get to fight because he's not going to need us. You know, he's going to, it's going to be one word that Christ uses to fight the battle of Armageddon. It's not going to be like he's got to really do anything. 
It's not going to be much of a battle, actually. It's just going to be a, a whooping, you know, that takes place right there in the middle of everybody. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the works of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this is Mother Babylon. This is the great harlot, the great religious world leader and her destruction and how she's destroyed and what she's about. Now chapter 18 talks about the political city of Babylon. And we're going, we'll hit it. It's only a few verses. Are y'all up for it? Oh, yeah. We got a little bit of time? Yeah, we do. All right. Now, remember, we're headed to Jesus coming. In chapter 19, Jesus is coming in verse 11. So here we are now. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. That's just really an unusual description, isn't it, really? I mean, you, you know what, you see what he's saying, right? He's saying, okay, ba the, the, the religious system, the, the, the one world church, the, the harlot that sat on the beast has been destroyed. So the, the world religion has been destroyed. Now, he says, a great city is destroyed, which basically is the political capital structure of the Antichrist kingdom, this big, gigantic economic center. If it's New York City, this is New York City that it's describing. If this is Rome then it's Rome that's being described. Uh, Babylon is used many times in the Bible to describe the center of wickedness on this earth. It, it, the, the city started back in the book of Genesis. You remember after the flood and Noah and his family, and then they began to have children and lineages and so forth. And in chapter 11 of Genesis, if you want to read all about it, it's all right there. In chapter 11 of Genesis, instead of being fruitful and multiplying and going out to the earth, the citizens, the people that were alive after the flood began to get together. They, came, they didn't go out to inhabit the earth. They all came together to one place to build a tower that would reach up into heaven so they could be like God. And they called it Babel, or, or Bab-El, B-A-B-L, E-L. E-L is the Hebrew word God, like El Elyon, El Shaddai, the, all the El names of God. So Bab-El means the gate to God. Now, the and I don't want to get too ticky about this, but just so for your interest, maybe. The word in Hebrew, Balal, B-A-L-E-L, or B-A-L-A-L, Balal, that sounds very much like Babel, uh, means confused, confusion. So they gathered at the place that they called Bob El, the gate to God. They were going to build a tower that would reach up into heaven so they could be God. And then God, you know, confused the languages and, and they couldn't talk to each other and that ended that project. And then everybody began to scatter because they couldn't even speak the same language as each other. Um, and the place became known as Babel, which means a place of confusion. And Babylon is the city that was built by Nimrod. You remember this? And then Nebuchadnezzar ruled the city of Babylon. And Babylon was the eighth wonder of the world. You remember it had the hanging gardens and it, had the, and it was so gigantically enormous and beautiful and wonderful. It was, I mean, the, the, the people that lived there marveled at the city and said, basically said, who could ever destroy a wonderful place like this? And it was 
all the way through the Old Testament, it was a tremendously gigantic place, elaborate, beautiful, world power, and there were many prophecies concerning its destruction. And it finally was destroyed, but it wasn't destroyed by some physical force coming in and, and just destroying it, you know, like they like like Titus did Jerusalem and not leaving one stone upon another. It just kind of faded away. It just kind of became desolate. And then about 200 B.C., after Christ, it finally was nothing. And, and now it, it's nothing. You go to Iraq now where Babylon was, it's nothing. As a matter of fact, Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild the city of Babylon. But it was way too costly and way too... I mean, it would take decades to build a city like, like described here. I mean, you, you know, if, 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 if God was talking about Babylon actually being the city of Babylon itself, I mean, we would be decades away from any of this because, I mean, how long would it take to build a city that would become the economic center of the world? I mean, imagine how many decades that would take to build and establish and, you know. So this is talking about a, a city that represents what Babylon is. Babylon, for the, all through the Old Testament when Babylon was mentioned, it was mentioned as the center of wickedness and deception and sorcery and evil. So when, he, when the angel says, Babylon the great, Babylon is destroyed, Babylon is destroyed, it's talking about the center of wickedness on this earth, of demonic activity, of uh, sorcery, fortune-telling, evil, uh, demon practice. and it's, That's what it's describing. And notice what it says happens to it. it, it it's been destroyed, it's fallen, the, the beast city has been destroyed. His, his political capital, you remember, God poured out one of those bowls on the throne of his, and it's become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit. And I, I like this. I don't know whether John had some trouble with birds. Uh, I don't, you know, he's on a, John is on the Isle of Patmos when, he's, when this is being given by the Spirit. And I don't know if Isle of Patmos had some seagulls or some, or some pelican, some pelicans or something. But evidently, John, there were some hated birds there of some kind. I don't know what it was because, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. I mean, that just kind of, all right, we have demons and we have foul spirits and we got these hateful birds that are, <laughs> that are there. But that, that's describing, I mean, yeah, vultures, yeah, vultures and these dadgum pigeons everywhere or something or seagulls or, you know, <laughs> something. But anyway, but, but you see it's talking about complete destruction. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. Now, it's just really kind of interesting to me that there are still some of God's people in, in this city. I'm thinking, why are they there? Because the Antichrist is going to kill them. They don't have the mark of the beast. Because if they had the mark of the beast, they wouldn't be his people. But there are evidently some people in this uh, city that is called Babylon that is, are still there. I don't know. Maybe they're missionaries, you know. Maybe they're undercover. Yeah. Maybe they're people still trying to reach people. Maybe still part of the 144,000. Maybe, maybe that's exactly right. Maybe it's part of the 144,000. But God says, you better get out of there. because be Right. And they're going to be there until the end. And they, they, he can't harm a hair on their head. That's good. It's a good thought. And he said, all right, well, come on out now because I don't want you to get messed up. Uh, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. And in the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. Oh, this is judgment here, buddy. There is no mercy whatsoever. It's, 
uh, be not deceived. Galatians 6 says, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And God says, give her double. Right. To that, yeah. To what he can do. Oh man, he as is. Far as or, oh yes. From one exchange that is exactly right, and God pours it out and pours double and mixes her double. She's she's killed the saints. She's spilled their blood. She's chopped their heads off. She's tortured them. She's punished them, and now she's going to get double what they got, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. In the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she, for she says in her heart, I sit as queen and I'm no widow and I'll not see sorrow. Not no, and she thinks she's invincible. She thinks that, I mean, basically her attitude was, who can touch me? I'm the greatest. Nobody can. But just like, just like Nebuchadnezzar said when he was in Babylon. You remember that? God turned him into an animal that went around and <laughs> ate grass and all that kind of stuff. And then when he finally, when God finally brought him back, Nebuchadnezzar wrote part of the book of Daniel. Part of the book of Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar telling everybody what happened to him and don't ever let it happen to you and, and, and praising the God of heaven and who's greater than God of heaven. I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know. That's, but it reminds you of, this, of, of the Antichrist and, the, and the, the attitude of the Antichrist Therefore, verse 8, her plagues will come up in one day. In other words, this, this is all happening in one day. As a matter of fact, it's going to get shorter than that. It's one hour. Death and mourning and famine. Uh, and, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. So uh, fire is going to come into this city and it's going to burn the whole place up in one hour. I mean, you'll see it in one hour. It says one day here, but it's talking about all of this is going to happen on the same day. You'll, you'll see in just a second. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. There are three groups of people that are going to be sad. The kings, uh, the merchants, and the shipmen. But you'll see them. The kings are going to be sad because they're, they're going to see her smoke burning. Standing at a distance... <laughs> or fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. So the kings that see her on fire are not going to go down there and try to rescue anybody. They're going to stand far off because they're afraid of what's happening to her. But they're going to they're cry for her because, I mean, this is where their power came from. This is where their money came from. This is where, where their whole lives were centered around, and she's burning up. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, luxuriously rich. The merchants that sold all that stuff, their markets and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and bodies and the souls of men. In other words, slaves. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who become rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. So the merchants are crying, the kings are crying, every shipmaster all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like the great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. 
Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. The end. <laughs> That's just the end of that chapter. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone. You remember what Jesus said about a millstone, right? He said it would be better for you if a millstone were tied around your neck and you cast into the sea than if you would offend one of these little ones. So here the millstone comes back again, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. When you throw a millstone into the sea, what, what would happen? Physically, what would happen? All of a sudden, there would be a gigantic splash. There would be ripples, and it would disappear from sight, never to be seen again. That's what he said this city was like took a great millstone and threw it out in the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall be not found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. Look at this. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp, you're not even going to have a light shining. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of a bridegroom and a bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. That's a tremendous word. Not hard to see what's going to happen, is it? So Babylon is gone. The religion is gone. There's only one thing left, and that's for Christ to come back again. And he's coming back in about 11 verses from now in chapter 19. Good description. Then comes the millennial kingdom, thousand-year reign of Christ. Then comes the judgment of Satan and the great white throne judgment. And then comes the new heaven and the new earth. And may it be so, amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Y'all do y'all have any questions about this? I mean, is this anything? Ishmael. How did Ishmael? What happened to Ishmael? Ishmael. How did, how did he fit in Ishmael is uh, the father of the Arabs. Ishmael is um the uh the father of as a matter of fact, um the Islamic religion considers Ishmael as their as their progenitor. Ishmael, he he he's just uh, he's just part of the mix of the peoples. Yeah, but, but he, if something happened where he wasn't supposed to have been born, but he, because he was born, he was the and well, here's and some of the river. yeah. Well, let me tell you what that is. In the book of Genesis, of course. God made the covenant with Abraham, and He said, "You're going to have a son, and that son is going to." Uh, is going to carry on the covenant, and, he's, and you're going to have as many children as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. And in you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, and those that curse you, I'm going to curse them, and those that bless you, I'm going to bless them, and you're going to make the earth great. And then Abraham went years after that promise with no son. And finally Sarah, his wife, says to him, um, it's obvious I'm not going to be able to have a child. And so here, take my maid, Hagar, and uh, she's fertile, and she'll give you a son. And so he did, and Ishmael was born of Hagar. And then Sarah conceived Isaac. And when Isaac was born, now Abraham wants to kill Hagar and Ishmael. But God stopped him. I mean, you read it. It's in the book of Genesis. All this I'm saying. And God stopped, Mo, God stopped Abraham and said, no, 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 you're not going to kill her. You're not going to kill him. Uh, he, Mo, uh, Abraham was sending them out in the desert with no food, no water to die. And God said, no, you're going to give them food. You're going to give them water. And God blessed them to live and to be alive. And even though Ishmael was not the son of promise, it was not Ishmael's fault that Abraham had sinned against God. Well, they, were they were the victims of it. And Hagar, and I mean, Abraham was a powerful man. He was the, 
he had he had great influence, and she was a she was a uh, his wife's attendant, and he had all of that power, and so she couldn't resist that. I mean, she was told to do that, and that's what she did, and and had the child, and God said, no, you're not going to mistreat them, you're not going to do that, and you're not going to kill them, and you're going to give them food and water, and you're going to take care of them, and you're going to let them stay close enough to you that they won't be attacked by by murderers and thieves and all that kind of stuff. You're going to protect them. And that's what happened. And, of course, Ishmael became the father of the Arabs and, and uh, the people that became the Arabs, let's put it that way. But now you have to remember, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't really even pay any attention to, that all of the people of the Middle East are the same race. They're all, they're all, they're all Jewish. They're all, they're all uh, Shem, uh, Shem, they're called Semitic people. There are Hamitic people. There are Semitic people. Hamitic people are the people of Africa, the black, dark-skinned Hamitic people. The, the Semitic people are the Jews and all of that generation, and the sons of Japheth. These are the, the three sons of Noah, remember? Everybody on the earth was killed except the three sons of Noah and Noah. And his sons were Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So all of the population of the earth came from one of those three boys. And the, Ham, the Hamitic people, Ham left the ark and went down into the places of the Nile and Egypt and uh, what would be Africa now. Je, uh, Shem went to the Middle East where the Arabs, Jews, all that. Japheth went north to Europe, which became the father of the European people, which is where many of us came from. And so you are either the son of Ham, the son of Shem, or the son of Japheth. Every person on the earth is. And so all of the people in the Middle East, whether they're Palis they call themselves Palestinians or Jews or Arab, but they're all Semitic people. They're all the same race. So it's like when I, I get kind of tickled when people start on the, in the news and other places like that start talking about all of this uh, racism over there. Uh, they're, they're all the same race, you know. It's like, okay, what, what are you talking about? They act like the Palestinians, because they're called Palestinians, that they're not Jews. They're Jews. Palestine is Jew. You know, Jerusalem is Jew. Syria is Jew. Uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Turkey, they're, they're, all, they're all Jewish people and, uh, you know, all Semitic people. They're called Arabs because they're Ishmael and Isaac, but... Uh, but they're the same race. You know, so what I'll, that's all I'm saying. All right, no problem. When you get to heaven, we'll, we'll know everything, and the Lord will tell us. <laughs> we won't have to worry about it. We'll know everything. All right, so uh, next Sunday night, we decide we wanted to meet. I mean, Thanksgiving's not going, y'all aren't going anywhere. We're going to meet. You know, we may be able next week to, to do the rest of these chapters, if that's okay with y'all. Are we, I mean, are, are you feel like you're missing anything, or we're going too, we're going too fast? There are only three chapters left. 1920, well, four, 1920, 21, and 22. Yeah, 22 chapters. Yeah. So 1920, 21, and 22. We might not be able to get all, I have to say we might not be able to get all four of them, but we'll, we'll get them in two. We'll, we'll, we'll get them in the, next few, in the next couple of weeks or so, and then we'll, uh, then we'll get in Christmas and everything. <laughs> we'll get, out of, the, we get out, of the, out of the tribulation and all that. But hey, we win in the end. I'm just telling you all that. I've read the end and it's good for us. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right in the end. That's right. All right. Father, we thank you for your love for us and for all of the things that you've done in our heart and our life. We thank you for the information that gives us security that you love us, that you have a plan, that there will be justice in this world and that evil will not triumph. We thank you for that promise and we see it. Lord, help us to walk with you and work with you and represent you on this earth. We know our days are short. We know that time is short. We believe in our spirit that you'll come soon. And our cry and our heart is come soon, Lord Jesus. We love you. We wait for your return. We welcome the opportunity until you return to work in the fields that are white unto harvest. And we pray that you'd bless that as we represent the kingdom in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. All right.